Dave here, how are you? This is SawStop's compact table saw. Not one mark. Now I have the Australian model here, which is 2000 watts, 50 hertz. The blade rotates at 4000 RPM. It has a rip depth, like a full depth at 90 degrees of 79.5 millimeters, tipped over at 45 degrees. The blade will then cut through a thickness of 54 millimeters overall in depth. And the maximum width that I can rip to the fence is 622 millimeters. This side has got the handle for me to carry the saw around like a suitcase. This has the harness for me to put the power cable on. This is a 10 amp, about two meters of cable. See this red button here, or this red mark here. We push that in, and the same at the other end, and that releases the rib fence. This is for transport. It goes above the handle. And then in the rip fence assembly is also a push stick. These are all the status lights. So it'll be a combination of green and red or green and off or red and off. All the information is there. Read the book and I'll tell you exactly what the com combinations of the lights do. This is also our access point to do fine adjustments inside the saw. These two screws here and there's a couple, three screws on the back. You'd need to undo those and slide this cover down through the bottom of the saw to access everything inside if you need to adjust the saw. We have the toolbox and that undoes the lock and inside is all of the gear in the toolbox and we'll go through all of that stuff very soon. You'll see down here is the dust port, a bit more obvious as I bring it around. It's directly under the access door to the side and these are all the instructions as well for if you have a brake activation, how to deal with everything. So that lifts up. There's a little spot just here that you push the end of one of the spanners into and that will uh, release a catch so you can raise that door up. I've plugged the saw in and this is the switch to turn the saw on. This is a bypass switch and this actually starts the saw spinning, the blade spinning. So when I turn this on, you'll see we've got a green light solid and a red light flashing. The saw is doing a check at the moment just to make sure everything's in order. And when that red light stops flashing, I've just got a solid green, the saw is ready to turn on. I'll do that now. While that light is flashing green, the brake will activate if I touch the blade with my hand or with something metal. So be aware of that. Just here is the bypass. If I turn that and then turn the saw on and let go, the saw was then in bypass mode, which means it would have cut me if I had contacted the blade. You use that if I want to check whether there's too much moisture in timber and whether that might cause a brake activation. So we'll leave that alone. There is a hole in it as well, I'll take a photo of that, that I can put a padlock in there so you can't get in there. So if I've got an apprentice working on site, they can't get in there and run it in bypass mode. It's always going to be in the safe mode. As soon as you turn it off, it defaults immediately back to safe mode. Okay, so raise and lower. And then I squeeze this just like that. And then I can adjust the angle. And then I can do a micro adjust to the angle here. And then when it's in position that I want, I push and that will lock it into position. Then I can still raise and lower, not a problem. But now the angle is locked and I can't move it. Okay, that's that. There's some adjustments here as well. We've had a look at each side of the saw and we've had a look at the functions on the front of the saw and I've shown you how to put it into a bypass mode to test for if the brake would have activated if the saw was still in the safe mode and showing you that 
By default, as soon as you turn the saw off, push that red paddle in, the saw defaults back to safe mode. And how to lock the bypass mode out if you don't want anyone at risk using a table saw. It will always be in the safe mode if you'd lock it. There's a couple of lugs here and there's another one over here. So I'm going to put it on the closest one there and there. And to lock it on, you do that and the same at the front. Now I can now move the rip fence backwards and forwards. This crank here adjusts the rip fence. If I was to bring it all the way over, it's going to hit. There's some little bumpers here. So it won't touch the blade. If I want to bypass that, I push them in like so, and now it will come up and touch the blade. Sawstop advise you to set the rip fence in line with the miter slot and I have done that and then they also advise you to adjust the blade to be in line with the miter slot and I'm going to show you how to set it perfectly parallel to the miter slot now there's a couple of ways you can do this you can set it up so that the blade is perfect to the miter slot and then do the rip fence or you can set the rip fence up perfect to the miter slot and then do the blade I prefer doing the blade first and don't forget the riving knife. The riving knife is extremely important as far as getting it perfectly in line with the blade. And I'm going to show you how to do that as well. There are three major things to do here. And then we're going to set the outside lug so that it's perfectly on the scale at the front so that the reticule will be perfect for the first scale and also for the second scale. It's a little trick I've worked out. Keep with me. We're going to do a couple of things here. First thing we're going to do is adjust this blade so that the blade is parallel to the miter slot. The back is not adjustable. The front is the adjustable part. I can move the front of the blade either left or right. And we're going to adjust it by that socket cap screw underneath that we just took the side off to expose. We'll use a five millimeter hex screwdriver to adjust. And I think if we turn clockwise, the blade will advance to the right. And if I turn counterclockwise, the blade will advance over to the left-hand side. We're going to use a combination square. And I'm going to use it in the miter slot. And I'm going to use the left-hand miter slot as I'm standing in front of the saw. The reason being, you see there's not much of a dip there. If I put it over on the other side, the miter slot is a whole lot closer to the throat and the, deep, the dip is steeper. It's a steeper incline and it's not going to give us as good a reading. Okay, now what I've done is I have marked one of the teeth with a black marking pen. And I'm going to use that one at all times. And I'm first of all, I'm going to rotate it to the back and set my combination square touch it just a little bit or to just touch it the other important thing is that tooth is on the left hand side of the kerf 
you'll notice some teeth, left side, right side. This one's over to the left. Just to keep things constant. I have a small camera up here and we're going to focus in really close and see what's happening. So you can see the combination square is in the mitre slot and over here is where that tooth is that I've marked. Hear that? Just touching. Now I'm going to rotate it to the front. There's the tooth with the mark on it. Bring it down and then bring my combination square up to the front. And it's missing. Only just missing, but it's missing. I've engaged the hex screwdriver underneath into that uh, socket cap screw and I'm on purpose going to move it away by, by turning that screw underneath. See the blade moving away? That is one full rotation clockwise. Now I'm going to bring it back, so rotating it counterclockwise until it's just touching. ever so slowly. Touching. Just touching. You might have to do that a few times at the front and at the back because basically you're halving the distance or one third, whatever the, the distance is between the hinge point at the back and the adjustment point at the front but eventually you'll get there. Once the blade is perfectly parallel to the miter slot, we can then move on to adjusting the rip fence to the blade because it's perfect and that's what we want. Last thing we do will be adjusting the riving knife. So I'm gonna take the riving knife out for this part because it's a bit easier with all of that exposed. And this is, this is a very easy part. I'm going to bring the fence across and release these little catches at the front. And you'll see that it is perfect. Now, how I got there, I took the four millimeter Allen key out of the toolbox. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to loosen these guys so I can actually take it off. I'm going to loosen this and I'm going to loosen the other one on the, at the front here. I'll do that now. That's loose and you can see it can move backwards and forwards. I'll do the same to the front. Done. Put the fence back on so it drops onto that little lug there it is now i'm going to advance the fence all the way over so it touches the blade because remember this it's all over the place it can go anywhere i'm going to advance the cursor so that the reticule is right over zero and you watch this will possibly move around i'm still moving the fence is touching the blade and not going anywhere Right on zero. You can just hold it there. Now that I'm on zero, I'm going to activate the lock. So it's this guy here, push it in. Done. And now that that's locked, the fence is in position. I can now move this around and I'm just going to bring it up so it's touching nicely all the way through and then drop that drop that and it now it can't go anywhere I can rotate the blade slowly and see what's happening yeah, it's a fair way away at the back there bring it across a bit further that's parallel all the way through now I can tighten the locating points up 
front and back. I've already done the front. I can do the back. Locked. And so every time now that I take the fence off, every time that I take the fence off and return it to the saw, it'll be in the exact right position. If I want to use the fence on the left hand side of the saw, what I can do now is take it off, rotate it so that I still have the correct part of the fence towards there and then that one there and there and now I can bring it in from this side and again those little fellows there are stopping it going all the way I'll do this so you can see where we're at and that's that's spot on right off the bat so but or it's the same situation I would release these undo the locating points and then get it perfectly in line with the blade lock the clamps and then tighten up the locating points unfortunately the measuring scale will not work when I have the rip fence on the left hand side of the blade now we have one set left to do and it's this set at the end here now with the fence when we want to go to the maximum width that we can rip at which is 622 millimeters we need to utilize this locating point and the other one on the front remember we've already set this one we want to set this one which is around 100 it's at 98 and a half millimeters further out to be exact so what we're going to do there is we will leave the fence on that one there that we've already set perfect we'll take it out to 100 millimeters on the scale on the silver scale unlock it and at 100 millimeters wide we can now rip a block 100 millimeters wide this saves us having to use measuring and all that kind of stuff because we've got a now we've got a reference block so I can loosen this so it's free to travel do the same on the front put this on without doing the clamps up with our 100 millimeter block there we can bring that up to it and that should give us 100 there and then we'll have a look at the cursor there we can move this to get it exact lock it in position lock the other one in position and then tighten this guy up and that will give me perfectly on the 100 millimeter at the front and then the only thing now to talk about is this function of the fence which is this outside section now I can lift it up and over all the way and then it drops down onto being the same height as the top of the table that's there so if I have some floppy kind of material that I'm wanting to cut I don't want it to drop down into that gap between the fence and the table it's supported now there's another reason to have this there's another setting on it I can lift it up and then push it back towards the fence and drop it again and now it's going to travel over the top of the table if the blade guard was on the splitter and I wanted to do a thin rip for whatever reason this allows me to go underneath the blade guard so that I'm not pushing the blade guard into the blade if I didn't have that there I wouldn't be able to get past the blade guard at all I'd be squashing the blade guard up and then I'd probably have an activation one of the other things while whilst I've got it here you'll notice just here there is a cam use a three millimeter hex driver or allen key to rotate the cam just put it in there and rotate and it will rotate the cam up or down and that supports the fence right out at the end so you'll notice if I don't have the cam tightened up I 
I can do this with the fence. So there's a cam here, there's a cam at the front, and there's also a cam just here. Yep, cam there, and another one here. Adjust those up and it'll work fine. The last thing to tune is this, and this is crucial. If you don't have this perfectly in line with the saw blade, you will end up having, if it's to the left of the blade, slightly, I'm exaggerating big time here, but if it's over to the left of the blade, as timber is going through, or if you're cutting plywood, what will happen is as the tip plywood or the timber goes through the blade, it will contact the riving knife and start pulling your timber away from the rip fence. If it's favoring the side of the blade towards the rip fence, what will happen is as you push the timber through, it will start wedging the timber hard up against the rip fence and you could have a catch. There are three screws down here that I think are four millimeter. They are. Use the Allen key that they supply to adjust it. The best way to do this is to have the riving knife actually fitted. So we'll lift the clamp, slide the knife in, and then close the clamp up. Now I've set mine perfectly. And how I did that was I got a straight edge. I just used the steel rule. Again, everything turned off and I laid the rule down the side. Don't forget, thumbs up, subscribe, ring the bell, share the video. I made sure that none of the teeth which create the curve, so I was against the plate of the blade. And then I looked and made sure that I had the right hand side of the riving knife inside the kerf and the left hand side of the riving knife inside the kerf as well. It will be easier for me to demonstrate this by lowering the blade down and having a look in the side. Then you can see all of the adjustments on the riving knife and also the adjustment for the clamp pressure on the riving knife clamp. You can see here, here, and under here are the three adjustment points. Those two at the top will adjust the angle on the horizontal plane. So as I'm pushing the timber through, it will say, oh, I'm going to pull it over that way or pull it over this way or keep it dead straight. The one at the bottom is the vertical plane. It tilts the riving knife left or right at the top. So it's crucial you do this with the blade in, the blade all the way to the top, and that four millimeter Allen key goes in quite easily. You can adjust it all from the top. You, you'll have to do everything in harmony because not one will fix it. You have to keep on tweaking top, bottom, front, bottom, back, bottom, and you'll get there. If you adjust the riving knife towards the right-hand side of the saw, as you're standing in front of the saw. You will need to loosen off the 10 millimeter hex bolt. And it's very easy. The, the clamp is actually spring loaded. You push the clamp in and that will expose the head of the bolt. This is the toolbox that was on the back of the saw. And inside we have these different items. To get to different things in here, it's being packed in really well. The first thing we do is pull this back and that allows me to rotate that off and then I can get this out, push that down, and that is the splitter. Out it comes. Next thing is the riving knife and a little bump there. There are two riving knives. This is the metric one. This is for 250 millimeter blades. The riving knife that's in the saw when it arrives in here is 254 millimeters imperial. It's important that you use the right size riving knife for the right size blade. Okay, what's the next thing we've got? 
The anti-kickback coils are down here. We push this in and that should allow them to come up. The tips are in underneath there. So you take that out and pop it there. Then we have the brake. The sword does not come with a spare brake. I purchased this and it lives here just in case I have an activation. And it fits in there very nicely. And out. This is the miter gauge. And the miter gauge isn't the best one in the world, but it does the job. I find that the miter gauge is typical of a miter gauge that comes with a table saw. Normally, you'd want to get a really nice quality aftermarket one. This does wobble around in the miter slot a little bit. So something to consider. What else have we got in here? Last thing to come out is the blade guard. It comes out very easily, like so. And that's all that goes in there. Now, assembling the blade guard onto the splitter is very easy. I'm going to demonstrate how to put the splitter or the blade guard support and the blade guard and the anti-kickback calls all on the saw. It's going to be a lot easier. First thing I'm going to do is release the clamp and take the riving knife off. Drop the splitter in, goes in exactly the same position, tighten the clamp, locked. That's the easy part. And see this, this one here, the one in the middle. There's one, two, three positions. We're going to put the blade guard in there and down and pull it back. And that's it. That's on. Now, the anti-kickback calls. There is a spring here and you can see where it's on my thumb. There's a little loop down there. That loop hooks over here. So I'll put it on there. And then I'm just going to pull it backwards and it drops in. If I don't want the calls in position, I do that and they're up out of the way. Then I slide this in down to the end and lock it. There's the insert done. Now down the end here, this is a very slippery section that they've got. The calls will not grab a hold of the insert. They just slide up out of the way. And so does the guard. I did mention before that when the rip fence is on, you can have that little auxiliary fence drops over to the side and will go underneath from left or from right. So the fence doesn't push the guard into the blade. That's it. I'm going to hold on to this. Now what's happening in here is there's a very, very low voltage constantly running through this blade while the saw is turned on with that green light just solid. Now, it's a anywhere between three to five volts. It has underneath the table here a brake that's got a sensor in it and it detects any change in that voltage. The tiniest fluctuation in that voltage will activate the brake. So this is their new brake and it works on all of the old models like, well, hold on, the ICS, which is the industrial, the professional, the contractor and the job site. This is their new one. This is 10R3 and it works on this one. See, the other brakes, the previous brakes won't work on this. You've got to use this one. Now, this is a dirty big aluminium block and it's got all these holes in it and this is a crumple zone. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. Uh, this is a hinge point for the brake to rotate into the path of the blade. There is a computer port here, and in here is a fuse. Now, what happens is when this activates, there's a fuse goes off, which releases the, a really massive high pressure spring in here, which will force this block right into the path of the the blade spinning at, you know, four or 5,000 RPM. The shock will disengage the saw blade and trunnion, everything that's down there. And like, it's not gonna come flying out and hit me, <laughs> but it will go backwards away from me 
um, down under the table. You'll notice that the riving knife will still stay above the table. So I'm going to act as a human capacitor and draw some of the electricity out of that blade. I've still got my fingers. I'm not having an ambulance come roaring to my place now to take me up to Katoomba or to Nepean Hospital. This is a huge thing. If you know someone who's into woodwork and they like their fingers, please share this video with them. They will thank you. Not one mark, not nothing. Zip, dada. Okay, time to give it to the puppies. Are you guys gonna sit? Sit. They slide out sideways. I'll put that back in. Right, I've got to wind the blade down all the way till it goes click and it's going to re-engage. All the way down and it'll go click. Got it. And now it's going to bring the whole assembly back up. But Yeah, it'll bring the whole assembly back up. Like so. Now I can rotate that and take that out. That's the locking pin that holds it in position. And I can undo that. Now this saw will not take a dado stack, but most people that I know have got a router table. This is magic, magic, magic. Got it. Got it. There's the whole thing. So you can see where the fuse has gone off in here and force this straight in. Now on the back here, there's a little lug and you saw it here first on Dave's live stream. It rotates ever so slightly. It was up here, so it was stopping everything from going in. This has to be down, so you can check that because when you look down the inside in here, you can see the keyway. There it is. You can see the keyway in the plastic has to line up. When I move this, see the keyway moves away. And in it goes perfectly. In goes the key. All the way in and turned. The side that's got the switch on it is normally the front of the saw and that's where you want the teeth pointing towards. It's just a little tip. Uh. If you know someone who's into woodwork and they like their fingers, please share this video with them. They will thank you. Links in the video description below. There is an affiliation there as well. Please use that if you want to buy one of these saws in Australia. See you next time. Bye.